Hello, Physics 173 students. Uh, today's experiment, uh, electron diffraction, is such a huge opportunity to understand the Schrodinger equation that we just can't pass up this opportunity. You know if a wave hits these slits that you'll get these uh, dots out here. Uh, let's say the principal maximum or the central maximum, and let's just just draw the the first two, uh, the first uh, maximum m equal one. Uh, where in which uh, m lambda is d sine theta, where, where d is the distance between the slits. Um, what Dr. Essergen has created uh, is a, this is, instead of these vertical slits, they are uh, uh, planes of the uh, carbon 60 atoms, um, which gives you, and they're, they're all randomly oriented, so you, you could have a plane, a uh, slit like this, and like this, and like this, and like this, and as you, as you rotate it that, these dots will trace out a circle, okay? So, um, say these are the two m equal one dots in, in the vertical slits. As you, if you spin this, you would trace out a circle. So what, we will actually see a circle as our uh, diffraction uh, m equal one maximum. Uh, so this is a, like a bright spot of electrons hitting the screen here. Um, so what's amazing here is that um, the, the electrons are accelerated, say, from this point A to point B through a voltage. And if you know that voltage and you multiply it by the electron charge, that gives you the energy. That gives you the energy of the electron. Um, then, uh, when, when the electrons hit the, the, this grating, which is, I'll, I'll just make a crosshatch so it looks more like the carbon 60s. Um, again, those will be randomly ordered to trace out the circle. And there's a couple of different spacings, so you'll get actually get two circles. But that's in your lab now, and you can read about it. So the energy of these electrons we know from uh, Physics 172, your, your E&M studies, is going to be just the, the charge of the electron times the voltage potential voltage difference that they're accelerated across. Um, and that gives you the energy of the electrons. The, the, the other thing is, is what, what happens is um, the, we, we know that the, uh, uh, the momentum of the electrons is equal to h over lambda. And of course, um, if we know the energy, uh, we can calculate the momentum. So from the energy, we can get um, that the uh, energy is 1 half mv squared, the speed squared. But, but we can always rewrite that as p squared over 2m. You could, if, if you use the fact that p is mv, um, you can always, you know, show this. Um, so really, the first thing this experiment proves is this, the de Broglie relationship. So if you know the voltage, and by measuring uh, the diameter here of this, this, measuring this diameter, you're then determining, um, uh, you're, you, you end up getting the uh, wavelength of the um, electrons. By the way, uh, yeah. Professor Berg, yeah. do you know De Broglie was a prince? I didn't know that. Yes, he was. He was a real prince. Oh my God! Well, I think every physicist should be a king. So, and uh, someone was actually, I think, kind of jealous of him. He was saying they, he he won the Nobel Prize because he was a prince. But I think he deserved it. Oh no, no, he deserved it for sure. This is cornerstone of quantum mechanics. Big, big stuff here. So, anyways. Um, if you know the spacing here, and you know and you know the distance here, um, I think that you you uh, uh, if this distance is L, and um, you, let's say this distance here was you you, you remember this that lambda is uh, uh, this distance right here say uh, radius of this circle say uh, is is on the order of uh, lambda uh, L over the distance, the spacing distance here, this little spacing distance here, D. Lambda L over D is, is going to be the order of this um, uh, uh, R. So lam lambda get, gets to be something like, um, is that right? Is that, is that relationship? Right? Let, me, let me do it real quick to see if I can do it. If I just had a diffraction grading, uh, if I had this distance D, is M lambda is equal to d sine theta, and sine theta is approximately tangent theta. This is this is the y or the radius of the circle, 
and this is L. Sine theta is probably tangent theta for small theta, so that becomes R over L, and this is D, and M is equal to 1, so this becomes lambda. So lambda is R, D over L. So, oh, uh, I, th I think that's what I got here, R, D over, uh, R, yeah, D so, over so, L. So that is for hard screen, right? When, yeah. When screen is hard. Yeah, yeah. So in our case, the screen is very close, so that approximation is not going to hold very well. So they have to do the geometry yeah, that you put in yeah, the lab, yeah, man. Right. But just, mm -hmm. just a mm -hmm. back of the envelope calculation here. Right, right. Again, we're trying, we want them to think as they read through the manual, mm -hmm. and we know they can do algebra. So let's say this, this distance is large, and, but just, I'm just going to show them something that's so beautiful. It's, 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 we just can't pass up the opportunity, <laughs> as you know. Okay, so what this does is, if you, by measuring, we know the energy, right, of the electrons, because we know what, what voltage we accelerate them through. So therefore, from this relationship, from this relationship, you know, setting this equal to this, we can determine the momentum for each, each uh, diffraction pattern we get here. So we're going to know the momentum, and by measuring the radius of this uh, ring here that you'll see on, on the screen, we're going to be able to determine the wavelength. So what is so beautiful about this is, therefore, you're going to get, you could get a table of momentums versus wavelength, and then if you wanted to, and we want you to for fun, whether it's a part of the manual or not, you may add this, it doesn't have, they don't have, I just want them to see this, um, they can also calculate 1 over lambda. So we've got raw data on the bench for electrons of, of the momentum as a function of one over lambda. And lo and behold, what do you know if you plot that, P versus one over lambda, you do get a straight line and the slope, the slope here, um, rise over the runs, the slope, I don't want to write M because that means mass of electron. Slope is, whoopsie, get me, do a little better than that for you. Hang on a second. The slope is a rise over run of this curve with the data points that you're going to get, okay? And that's going to be equal to Planck's constant. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. All raw experiment from your physics 1 and 72 knowledge. And, of course, you learned about interference in waves in 1 and 72. Yeah, now, let, let's take that information and walk over here and do something something else which I think is so delightful because I believe uh, I'm going to erase this this little geometric yeah. thing here that, uh, is, that is very amazing that a particle actually behaves like a wave right and from the Millikan oil drop they know that particle has mass and so that's really why that Millikan oil drop is done for them because they can get the charge of the uh, of course if you know the charge of the electron from the Millikan oil drop experiment and you know Q over M uh, from the Q over M measurement that did in physics 172. You can use that number and that number to determine the mass of electrons. Lo and behold, yes, electrons have mass. Definitely have mass. And so you've got a particle of mass behaving like a wave. Knock on, I guess that's not wood. But it doesn't get any, any, any be more beautiful than that. Now, what I want to do is... From the photoelectric effect, you know that a photon, a photon, a photon's energy gets converted into, uh, the photon hits this thing, and you get yourself an electron, okay? So, an electron, we know an electron's a wave, and we know that the energy of the photon is equal to H nu, the Einstein relationship, and, of course, this is proven by the photoelectric effect experiment, experiment that you did. Therefore, if that energy, if this wave is converted into another wave, it's very natural uh, to say, well, the energy of the electron is the, uh, this is the, the, the frequency of the photon. The energy of the electron, then, is equal to H times the frequency of the electron. This is a number that you measure. This is also a number that you measure. Okay, so this is a calculatable number from this relationship. Okay, so if we assign a frequency to the electron, it has to have a frequency because it's a wave. We can worry about dispersion later. Your instructor will address it, the spreading of the electron wave packet. But what's so wonderful now is if I simply write down that the energy of the electron is equal to its, moment, uh, its momentum squared 
over twice its mass, electrons have mass. Plus, and we know electrons have potential energy. They have potential energy. Uh, I'm gonna put a plus sign here and put Q electron times the, the potential field that they're in, knowing that the charge of the electron is a negative number. You can deal with that later. I don't like to write little e because then it has, becomes minus. I'd rather this be plus because I don't like people freaking out about minus signs uh, when we know we can deal with it later. But this then becomes the energy relationship of the electron, which, which if, I, if I write P is a, equal to H over lambda, these are electrons now, um, I can play around with this uh, for, for fun. Um, I, the, the energy, the, the moment the electron is going to be, let me write h is h over 2 pi, and let me write 1 over lambda, um, or let me multiply by 2 pi over, pi over 2 pi. This thing right here is what we call h bar. It just brings the 2 pi. This thing here is called the wave number of the electron. Okay? Then I can also write the energy of the electron which but from the Einstein relationship, conversion of energy here is H times the frequency of the electron. If I do the same thing, uh, I could write this as H over 2 pi times 2 pi times the frequency. This thing right here again is our old friend H bar, which I hope you've seen in your textbook and on your chalkboards, or I guess those are our, our computer screens. Up. This thing here is what we call good, our good old friend omega. And this is the energy of the electron. I just want to, I'm just using, I'm just doing some algebra changing to make this thing look like something we recognize. This thing here, instead of, this is H nu electron from the photoelectric effect. So what I end up with is H bar omega of the electron. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suppress the subscript E because it's obvious we're talking about electrons. This thing right here then, P is H bar K. So I write it H bar squared K squared over 2M plus this uh, potential energy term. So energy is kinetic energy plus potential energy. This is a beautiful form. Now, going back over here, okay, you know from physics 152 that light is an electromagnetic wave and light has an interference phenomena, okay? Uh, and so you know that waves have a wavelength. And therefore, the, the, the mathematical form of the wave can be written as, uh, I'm going to call it psi, but you could call it the electric field if it were a photon. If it were an electromagnetic wave, which is a collection of photons. So this could, this could be, instead of being, like you're normally used to seeing this, the electric field is equal to some uh, amplitude of cosine of kx minus omega t, where omega is 2 pi times frequency, k is the wave number 2 pi over the wavelength thing. You're used to seeing that, okay? Well, you know what? Um, for electrons, we're, gonna, we're not going to use E. We're going to use another symbol, and that's going to be some amplitude. I'm just going to call this an amplitude of this wave function, just like that's a wave function. So this is a, a fine way to write an electron wave function, because we know it does this. There's a mathematical wave function that describes it, but it's got to be easier to, to use Euler's relationship and write this as a e to the j kx, kx minus omega t. It's going to be easier to do that, where j is the square root of minus 1. That's just going to be easier for me to, to, to run around the chalkboard or, the, or the, the whiteboard with. Now, once I have that, it, it really is, you say, yeah, yeah but the, that's a plane wave. And these electrons are these little things that are sort of jumping around like humming bees, and they have this zero-point motion. No one really knows the mystery of the uncertainty, but blah, 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 I'm all worried. That's a plane wave. Burke, you can't say that, but you know what? I can because whatever the exact functional formation of the electron wave is, by Fourier's theorem, this is, is really an algebraic proof, any, any waveform can re, be written as an infinite sum of these, or a Fourier integral. And, and if, I'm, if I want a wave equation, the differential operator is going to go through the inter, integral operator, and they're going to operate on just some amplitude of k and omega, and this is going to be a number, and those operators are going to operate on this function. So my wave function uh, that I'm looking for to create a wave equation is going to have this form. 
And no matter how complicated the actual wave function is, it can be written as an infinite sum of these, which is an integral, a Fourier integral. So if I do it for if I if I do what I'm about to do for this, I'll just leave this as a. If I do it for this, it's it's true for any wave function of the electron, because any wave function of the electron can be written as a Fourier integral. So why does this give me the Schrodinger equation? Why? Because whatever the Schrodinger equation is, the solution is going to be a wave or a sum of plane waves. And since the differential operator is linear, linear it, it, this, it, the, the equation will go through the, in, the integral uh, operator. So I know that the electron wave something looks like this because I get, I get these interference patterns. I know it's got to look like that uh, in its most basic form. So how do I, and I know that the energy electron is this, and it's equal to this from the de Broglie equation, and I know this is the uh, potential. So the energy, the total energy is kinetic plus potential energy. So what do I do? The, the question is, what do I do to this function to generate h bar omega? Well, if you take h bar over j d by dt and operate it on this function, you will get, uh, uh, you, you'll bring down a, 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 a minus h bar over j, sorry. You'll bring down a minus j omega when the d by dt hits this. And so that'll give you h bar omega a e to the j kx minus omega t. I'm trying to speed up so you, I don't give you a two hour lecture. So minus h bar over j d psi by dt it's just going to give me h bar omega times this thing here, which we're calling psi. It could be any symbol. Psi is nice because your quantum mechanics books use psi. Okay. Oh, let me run out of space here. Okay, so I can see that. In other words, I want a wave equation that, re, that re, reissues this result because I know this is an experimental fact. So any wave equation that reissues this result, which I've verified by electron diffraction and the photoelectric effect, I'm going to be happy with. Um, and so, uh, so with Schrodinger. So, th so I, I know that, th that this action on, on this wave function will, will produce the energy of the electron times psi. Now, uh, get, let me stay there. Don't move. Uh, where's my spray? Where's my spray? Oh, right, right here. Okay, yeah. let's, let's, let's come over here and let's get rid of some of this stuff here that we don't need any of. That we don't need any of that. Um, let's get rid of that. <coughs> It's really such a beautiful uh, thing uh, that you get here, and you're actually getting an experimental verification of, by combining these two experiments, you, you guys, you got the Schrodinger equation, okay? And, and, and you, you need to see this. Um, the, the next thing, what do I do to psi to get the... Uh, I'd like to bet, do something to psi to produce this, this thing here. Um, where is it? I'd like to do something to to produce that, produce, for this term in front of psi. So it turns out I can do that. If I, if I go minus h bar squared over 2m and take two, two, two spatial derivatives with respect to x of psi, that's going to give me, if I take the derivative of this twice with respect to x, I'm going to get... This thing's a constant. It's going to be minus h bar squared over 2m. That's still there. If I take the derivative of this twice with respect to x, I'm going to get a j squared k squared a e to the j kx minus omega t. And this j squared is minus 1, but it's that composite. So this is going to be h bar squared over 2m. Uh, uh, time. And this thing here is just psi again. So I, I see minus h bar squared over 2m Second derivative of psi with respect to x gives me, minus, gives me minus h bar squared. Oh, this is k squared. H bar, it gives me h bar squared k squared over 2m times psi back, which is going to be, give me this term times psi. And this is just a constant. So a constant times psi is that constant times psi. So what I can literally write is if I go, if I write minus h bar over j d psi by dt. If I set that equal to minus h bar squared k, uh, minus h bar squared over 2m, 
Second derivative of psi with respect to x, Scott, psi is a function of x and t, space and time, plus the charge of the particle times the potential it's in. This could be a function of space times psi. This, this thing here, if you put in this solution, which we know it has to be that solution or an infinite sum of those, and these are all linear operators, so they would go through any summation index, discrete or continuous, this, will re this equation will reproduce the fact that h bar omega psi is equal to h bar squared k squared over 2m psi plus the particle charge times the potential times psi. Of course, psi, you can divide by now, so h bar omega is equal to h bar squared k squared over 2m uh, is, plus the charge particle particle charge plus times the potential that it's in. This is just the energy relationship which was which you proved uh, in the photoelectric effect and the electron diffraction experiment. And so since this result is reproduced from this equation, and we know the solution to that equation is this or an infinite sum, or discrete or continuous sum, we know that this equation has to be true. And that is... Schrodinger's wave equation. So what's so beautiful about this is I, I, I haven't said anything about the uncertainty principle. Of course, it's it, it, one way to re-derive it uh, uh, is to, uh, uh, from, directly from the Schrodinger's equation. The other way to uh, experimentally observe, the uncertainty principle is observed here. Um, and Feynman, and, and uh, you could read about that in Feynman's lectures on physics, how just simple electron diffraction can give you the uncertainty principle with a factor of pi missing, but it, it's good enough for government work, as they say. So uh, the exciting thing about today's experiment, electron diffraction, is if you combine uh, today's experiment with your early uh, results of the photoelectric effect, that you can take all of that information, which is all they are is experimental facts, and you can uh, uh, reason your way into, uh, really, uh, the Schrodinger wave equation. So I don't want you to do this electron diffraction experiment without somebody telling you this and nudging you and say, hey, you just, you just experimentally, with those two experiments, you just proved this. So let's forget about the great mystery of this now because you've proven it. And like, like the, the, fo the photon field is the electric field, the, the electric, uh, is the electric field, the, 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 the field for the electron itself we call psi. This is the electron field. It's a field. And so that takes you into field theory and... Um, uh, and that's something I had to study when I was a kid because they hadn't in, invented, well, they had just invented string theory when I, so I went through all the field theory and then Schwartz came and talked about string theory. Anyways, hope you guys enjoyed this. It should start to get fun, you know. And did you know Schrodinger drove this equation while he was vacationing in Alps? I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> really? Was he skiing? Oh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what he was up to, but uh, you can definitely uh, read about it. Uh, Schrodinger was an interesting guy, so... <laughs> they, should, they should all read about history, because uh, there's something I didn't know. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I think history is so rich, and uh, it's, it's all beautiful, you know? You want to see... So you're gonna, we're going to do the experiment, right. with so the, and, and the you're going to take over from there. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you, Professor uh, Burke. Yeah, you bet.